So to see how our place did in the subsequent quarters in the first year, we'd like to refer to the spring, the summer, and the autumn quarter financial statements at this time. We're looking at the spring quarter first. We note that sales have not changed markedly. They're still running at about $316,000 in sales. However, note that we have achieved some operating efficiencies in our controllable expenses and in our cost of sales. So that our operating profit is $44,060, which is greater than the occupation cost of $34,350 in the spring quarter. In the first quarter, you might recall that the operating profit ran just about $23,500, which resulted in the loss in the first quarter. So at the end of the spring quarter, we see that our profit has gone from negative to a positive $8,254. The operation is improving, which is typical of many businesses. In the early stages of the business, we really are uncertain about a number of things. While we have designed the menu, as we think the guest was likely to approve of, we're really not certain what that menu mix is going to be. And we may find that we carried additional items in inventory, in quantities that were excessive to meet the menu mix. Recipes and production related to those food items may need to be fine-tuned. So it's very likely that food costs and beverage costs in the early stages of the restaurant are likely to be higher than industry norm. Over time, those metrics are likely to conform to what might be typical of industry standards associated with that particular restaurant concept. The same would be true for other areas where expense decisions need to be made in advance of the guest participation. Payroll as an example. Again, we don't know how many people are going to show up on a given night, and our tendency may be to overstaff in anticipation of providing a positive experience to the guest rather than a negative experience. And over time, as we develop more history and more experience, management is better able to control the cost of sales and the controllable expenses. And the result, as you see here in the spring quarter financial statement, is a significantly improved profit. If we look at the balance sheet, you'll notice that within the current asset area, the time deposit has a balance of zero. Well, the decision to invest in that time deposit, $12,500 at the beginning of the first period, may have been prudent from an interest income standpoint because we did enjoy a 3% annual interest income on that $12,500. You might recall that those funds were not available to us and in turn we had to borrow on the line of credit $23,000. And the cost to borrow on the line of credit was 15% annual interest. So clearly earning 3% on the time deposit while borrowing on the line of credit at 15% does not make good economic sense. So wisely, the management team at our place cashed out the time deposit on the first day of the second quarter, and the available balance went to immediately reduce the line of credit. Along with improved cash flow from operations during the quarter, you'll notice that the line of credit balance was almost totally negated during the course of the quarter. Its ending balance was $1,898. If we took the time to audit the ending balances for the long-term debt on the mortgage and the lease, we would find that we are continuing to make good on our promises, which have to be made because that mortgage, incidentally, typically comes with some incentives for the owner to repay that mortgage, such as repossession of the assets through the lien that's associated with the mortgage. So when we do not have funds to make good on those promises, uh, the game really starts to run out of time very quickly because those assets are repossessed by the lenders. The retained earnings account, you can see at the end of the first period, it was negative $9,807. If we add the $8,254 net income from the spring quarter to that negative value, the retained earnings deficit has been reduced considerably and the ending balance is minus $1,553. Things are improving. We go to the summer quarter, the end of the third period in our place. We'll note that sales are improving. Operating profit continues to improve. You'll notice the payroll has increased. The summer quarter in the region where our place is located 
is a strong business quarter and management made deliberate plans to add additional payroll through additional FTEs and began to increase the wage rate to reward those employees that have now managed to work their way through six months of operation at our place. So although payroll has increased, uh, the increase in sales has also been taken into account in the increased operating profit. Operating profit is now up to $48,084. Total occupation costs remain unchanged and the profit after tax has increased to $11,136. Reviewing the balance sheet accounts, we note that we are accumulating a little bit more cash on hand. An audit of the line of credit account shows that we now have a zero balance in the line of credit. The improved operations has resulted in payoff of the line of credit and the note payable account has been reduced by $10,000. A $10,000 payment was made on the note during the summer quarter, reducing its balance from $30,000 to $20,000. Again, an audit of the total long-term debt by combining the current and the long-term portion of the mortgage and the lease respectively will reveal that we continue to make good those payments. The retained earnings account now shows a positive balance of $9,583, which is now the sum of the three quarters profit after tax. The winter, which was negative, the spring and the summer, which were both positive. The fourth quarter represents the final financial statements for the first year of operation. And business continues to improve. Profitability continues to increase over time. We are accumulating additional cash on hand. The cash balance now is $11,450. Again, the note was paid $10,000 at some point during the quarter because the ending balance is down to $10,000. The line of credit is zero. The mortgage and the lease balances continue to decline. It looks like our place is starting to hit its stride when it comes to a cash flow standpoint. The retained earnings account at the end of the year shows a positive balance of $23,002. Now that we've completed a year's worth of operations and have a year's worth of history, we are in a position to easily analyze the operation using a couple of common metrics in the business of restaurants. One of them will be the sales to investment ratio. Sales to investment ratio is calculated by dividing the annual sales by the total investment. We could have projected this at our place using the pro forma. The pro forma, if you recall, had one quarter's worth of sales projected, roughly $316,000, and we could have annualized those sales, projected sales, by multiplying the winter quarter forecast by four. And we could estimate the annual sales at our place, and we could have calculated the sales to investment forecast at the beginning of this business's life by doing that. But now that a year has gone by, we have the actual sales data, we know the actual investment, and we can calculate that. Sales to investment ratios in the restaurant business tend to run at about a two to one relationship, meaning that you probably want to be able to demonstrate the ability to generate at least $2 in sales for every dollar of investment. If we compare that to our place, by going back to the opening day balance sheet, you may recall that the opening day balance in the total assets, which equal the total investment, was $599,000. The middle column sales forecast on an opening day was $316,000 roughly. If we multiply that by four, it would equal $1.2, $1.3 million in forecasted sales. So the estimated annual sales of 1.2 million, approximately. 
And if we were to round 599 to 600,000, we can see that the sales to investment ratio at our place was just about a two to one relationship. A little bit more than $2 in sales were forecasted on the $599,000 total investment. And in the restaurant industry, if you're not able to generate more than $2 in sales for every dollar of total investment, you're probably not going to have adequate cash flow to survive. Make good the debt payment and the operating responsibilities. So sales to investment ratio is one of the key metrics that is used in this industry. Return on investment is another metric that industries use. And the financial community calculates this as the net income plus the interest expense divided by the total investment. But we're a small business operator here in our place, and we recognize that there are multiple investors in this property. We have the private investor that provided $305,000 in capital, happens to be debt. We have $80,000 worth of leased equipment that we have debt associated with. We also have $150,000 in investment provided by the owners. So from a small business perspective, we're going to approach our return on investment calculations a little bit differently than the financial community, because this has multiple investors, and those people that are probably most interested in the return are going to be the owners. So we're going to calculate a return on the owner's investment. And Last, we will look at the return on net assets. Net assets are an expression used for the long term or the fixed assets. And the manner in which that is calculated is by calculating this alphabet soup acronym called EBITDA, E-B-I-T-D-A. We're going to have to calculate the annual EBITDA for our place, divide that by the fixed or the net assets to calculate the return on the net assets. So what is EBITDA? Well, E stands for earnings, B stands for before, I stands for interest, and this is interest on the long-term debt, T stands for taxes, and those are income taxes, not property taxes, D, our good friend depreciation, a non-cash expense, and A, amortization, also another non-cash expense. So EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. 